Cognitive Neuroscience Bite Size. With Jamie Ward, University of Sussex, author of The Student's Guide to Cognitive Neuroscience and The Student's Guide to Social Neuroscience. In today's Cognitive Neuroscience Bite Size, I'm going to be talking about different memory systems in the brain. Is it possible to lose your memory? Well, in the 1950s, neurosurgeons operated on a very special case called HM, now identified as Henry Meliasson. HM had severe epilepsy, so the surgeons removed part of the brain which they thought the epilepsy was coming from in the hippocampus and the surrounding areas in the medial temporal lobes. At this point, nobody really knew for sure what the hippocampus was doing. Uh, but what was found is that after the surgery, HM had lost his ability to acquire new kinds of information. So he couldn't recognise new people, he was unable to learn new vocabulary, he couldn't remember what he did yesterday, where he last went on holiday, he would have problems recognising himself in the mirror. And he was also unable to remember certain things before his surgery, so events that had happened in the years prior to um, having the operation. So HM appears to be a, a case of somebody who's lost their memory. But if you think about this more carefully, it's a little bit more subtle than that. So HM didn't lose the ability to speak. HM was able to recognise certain people around him. Uh, and HM was still able to navigate around um, very familiar routes from his childhood, for example. So for HM, some key aspects of his memory was impaired, but not all of them. And one way of thinking about this is that the brain has multiple ways of dealing with memory, and the kinds of memory impaired in someone such as HM, or perhaps in um, people who have dementia of the Alzheimer's type, is that one particular aspect of memory, sometimes called declarative memory, or uh, explicit memory is uh, very impaired, but other aspects of memory aren't. And of course this fits with the view that the whole brain is capable of learning and capable of change, what we might think of as uh, plasticity. And there's a very simple neurobiological mechanism behind this, which we can um, think of in the phrase, what fires together, wires together. So here the idea is that if different sets of neurons are firing together, that the brain will change its structural properties. It will grow in terms of um, remodeling synapses, increasing um, protein synthesis at the site in which the neurons connect. So these changes in the way that things happen, say in our daily life, that two things happen simultaneously, so these sets of neurons fire, and then the connections between the neurons would grow. This is what we would call synaptic consolidation, and this happens all throughout the brain. It's not special to the parts of the brain that were uh, damaged in HM. So what is it that the hippocampus and the medial temporal lobes are actually doing? We'll explore this in more detail. The highest level distinction between different memory systems is that between short-term memory and long-term memory. Short-term memory is about information that's held in the present, so it's often referred to as working memory, and it has limited capacity. There's only so many things we can hold in mind at what, any one point in time. Whereas long-term memory is our information about the past, and this is, um, to some extent, limitless, or doesn't have an easily countable limit to it. The way in which we would test for short-term memory is by giving people a set of things to remember, such as a list of words or digit. So in digit span, you'll read a list of words such as 5, 9, 3, 2, 1, 5, 7, and you have to repeat these digits back. What we find is that people have a limited capacity. They can typically remember about seven digits. Um, but what's interesting is that a patient such as HM with amnesia also can remember typically around seven digits. So it suggests that in HM, this short-term memory system uh, is intact. And what we find is that um, there are some patients who might have problems with short-term memory, and these are often to do with cortical damage, so in the frontal and parietal networks that are involved in activating and sustaining information over time, whereas the medial temporal lobes are involved in different kinds of memory. 
Um, but there are also short-term memory systems for visual information. So just as there might be a limit to the number of words or verbal information you could hold at one time. If you're presented with a series of objects on the screen, it's found that typically people can remember in detail about four objects. So here what's presented is that you might have different shapes of different colours or lines of different orientations. And then you're shown a different set and you have to say in what way is it different or what was in that location. And we find here that people have a visual memory span of about four different objects. Beyond that, uh, memory performance um, starts to break down. One of the other features of short-term memory is that different short-term memory systems seems to have uh, it seems to be somewhat specialised from each other. So we know this because if you have a digit span of about seven digits, but at the same time you're having to hold in mind visual information, you can do that with very little interference, your span doesn't go down. Whereas if you're having to hold in mind seven digits, and at the same time you're having to hold in mind different people's names, then you get interference with these two systems. So again, it seems that there are somewhat specialised systems for verbal information and spatial information, such as in the, um, the visuospatial sketchpad in the Badley model and the phonological loop. So here you've got separate systems for short-term memory held together by something that controls the information flow uh, into these systems. So where is short-term memory uh, in the brain? So the, because there are several short-term memory stores, there isn't going to be a single answer to that. It will depend on the kind of information that's held in mind. But one claim is that all short-term memory is, is the, t the activation of long-term stores. So within our brain, we have um, stores that store visual information about objects, information about colours, information about words. And all short-term memory might be is just activating that from the top down using uh, what we might say is executive resources in the frontal and parietal lobes. After the distinction between short-term and long-term memory, the next major distinction is that between declarative memory and non-declarative memory. Declarative memory are memories for things that you can verbally articulate. So, for example, I can put into words my memory of uh, my last holiday, or I can describe the, uh, uh, the countries of the world, for example, this would be uh, semantic memory. Non-declarative memory is hard to put into words, so I can remember how to ride a bike, but I can't describe that to you. Riding a bike would be called procedural memory, and what we find is that um, patients who have amnesia also have good procedural memory. They don't forget um, their old skills, such as uh, playing a piano or riding a bike. And indeed, you can teach them new skills. So one of the things that was done with HM is teaching him to uh, use a mirror in order to control his hand movement. So this is kind of tricky if you think about it, because if you want to uh, trace a line in a mirror, your visual system says that you're moving your hand left, when in fact your motor system is moving it right, that everything is reversed. But you can learn to um, use a mirror to control your motor movements over time. And HM was able to do that, even though he would deny ever having done it before. So from day one to day two, you could show he improved, but he would claim he's never done it before. Some of the other non-declarative memory systems would be um, stores of uh, objects and words. The way that this is assessed is through something called priming. So if I show you a word like house and get you to read it, and then I show you the word house again and get you to read it again, you will be faster on the second time than you were on the first time. And this is called priming. Uh, and again, people with amnesia also show this. They are also faster on the second time relative to the first time, even though um, they will perhaps say, I don't remember seeing the word house before. The neural mechanism for uh, priming is relatively well understood in terms of uh, having um, smaller bold processing in fMRI on the second occasion relative to the first occasion. So here it seems to be that the, uh, the neural response is smaller or perhaps more efficient um, on the second time in which a stimulus is encountered. And this happens in the localised regions that are involved in processing words or seeing objects. Procedural memory, on the other hand, the neural substrates are perhaps in the basal ganglia to do with skill learning, particularly motor skill learning. 
Another type of non-declarative memory is conditioning. So traditional Pavlovian conditioning in which maybe you see uh, uh, a red square and the red square triggers an electric shock. What you find here is that again patients with amnesia, if you pair uh, a red square with an electric shock they will have an anticipatory uh, reaction. They will generate uh, a skin conductance response uh, or a fear reaction even uh, when the shock isn't presented. So they seem to have normal uh, Pavlovian conditioning. By contrast, patients with damage to the amygdala show impaired um, conditioning of uh, seeing a red square with this. So they have problems in non-declarative memory. What you find is that the patients with damage to the amygdala, although they have impaired fear conditioning, they can tell you, oh, when I see a red square, I tend to get a shock. So they have some memory for this association, but it is not a, uh, a conditioned fear response. Whereas amnesics show the opposite dissociation. Um, they do have a, a non-declarative conditioned fear response, but they would say, I don't know what's going to happen when they see the red square. But obviously there is a memory system in the brain that does know what's going to happen. So it, it suggests that this association is duplicated in different systems, consistent with the uh, multiple memory systems view of the brain. So the evidence so far brings us to the view that the hippocampus and the medial temporal lobes are specialised for particular kinds of memory, namely declarative memories. But why is this so? What exactly is it that these regions of the brain are doing? So the most common way of thinking about this is that the hippocampus acts like an index that binds together different elements of a memory. So if you think about your memory about going on holiday, this might involve uh, the visual aspects of the holiday, your emotional feelings, was it pleasurable, the spatial scenes of the holiday, uh, maybe what the conversations you had, the people you were with, and all of these obviously distributed highly throughout the brain. But the hippocampus is able to draw these together partly by virtue of its neuroanatomy having lots of uh, connections being a central part of the brain. And over time, uh, the, the hippocampus might serve to kind of bind these different distributed elements uh, together. And this is a process that's called systems consolidation, that is different from the synaptic consolidation, what, why, what fires together wires together, that I described earlier. It involves um, distributed systems throughout the brain that are gradually consolidated. Um, such that perhaps over time the hippocampus is needed. You have effectively transferred the memory into this distributed system. This might also explain why people with amnesia or Alzheimer's disease do seem to have some memories, that they're very good at remembering events of things that happened 10, 20 years ago, but really bad at remembering things that happened one year ago or perhaps even one day ago, because these memories haven't been consolidated. The, the hippocampus can't transfer them out and it can't hold on to them, whereas older memories have effectively left the hippocampus and gone into other parts of the brain.